So uh, thank you, Terry. Good morning, everyone. Let me add my own um, personal welcome to all of you for joining us for this important uh, genomic medicine meeting um, and, uh, and really stress how valuable uh, these types of meetings are for NHGRI. But I also think that in some ways this meeting, as you heard it describe what the objectives were by Rex, really points to the idea that it's a bit of a taking stock and then looking forward. Um, kind of a set of objectives. And this is happening in a broader context for something that's very important to NHGRI, and that is um, a strategic planning process that we recently kicked off. And so while this meeting is not formally part of uh, uh, that strategic planning process, we are going to gather input both from what the meeting does and also during a focus session tomorrow. Um, where this will be um, explicitly discussed. And so I thought it would be important to set that context by giving you a background about the strategic planning process, recognizing some of you in the audience have seen this, and I won't at all uh, care if you want to just check email because you've already seen these uh, slides um, in other venues as we've been starting to march along with the strategic planning process in terms of events to help get us the kind of input that we want. We kicked off this new round of strategic planning at a meeting of our advisory council in February of this year, so we're only a handful of months in, and uh, we certainly have a long way to go. If you really want to get more details about sort of the background um, for what we are trying to accomplish and, the, and the, the reason we've done this in the past and the reason we are doing this now, I would send you to uh, this uh, uh, video, uh, which is the longer presentation I made at our advisory council meeting back in February. In brief, one of the main points I made, which is worth thinking about, is just how much the world of genomics has changed. The discipline has only been around for about 31 years since genomics was named as a discipline. Uh, our institute has now existed for 29 years, about to hit our 30th anniversary as an institute or as an organization. More than 28 years ago since the Human Genome Project began, and we're now 15 years out from having the Human Genome Project completed. One of the things we as an institute did over the past couple of years is really to think a little bit about, well, what is our role? In the last 15 years since the Genome Project ended, we've seen genomics spread across the NIH campus. We are no longer the only funder of genomics research at the NIH. In fact, in aggregate, we're by far the minority funder of genomics research at NIH because everybody's doing genomics. And that's great. That's part of what we wanted to have happen. But in thinking about where we want to go towards the future, we spent a couple of years sort of thinking about our identity, thinking about what our priorities are, and thinking about where we want to be in the future. And we sort of came up with a phrase or a, a mantra, if you will, or a slogan that sort of embodies what we see as our key role in this ecosystem. And that really is at the forefront of genomics. We're not all of genomics by any means at NHGRI, but what we can do is lead, and we could be at the forefront. And so with this in mind, as we think about our identity going forward, we recognize that it was probably time to also start doing something we've done routinely since the beginning of the Institute, and that is to have a fresh strategic plan provide a guide for what we should be trying to accomplish. The historic origins of strategic planning date back to the Genome Project, where there were basically three strategic plans that we and others created that helped guide the efforts of the Human Genome Project. And that successful process was really viewed to be very important, which is why we as an institute alone forged a strategic planning process and then published a new strategic plan the day the Genome Project ended, which lasted until about 2010. But by 2011, we recognized it was time for a new strategic plan. And so we published that, um, and that corresponded shortly after I became director of the Institute. I would point out that the strategic plan published in 2011 um, in many ways provided the origins for many of the things we're going to be talking about uh, today, because in that title you'll note we made an overt uh, mention of genomic medicine in the title and the centerpiece figure um, from our, uh, that strategic plan, um, which is now, keep in mind, seven years old, sort of embodied this notion that the, what the Genome Institute really needed to do was expand aggressively beyond fundamental knowledge of genomes and how they operate and how they play a role in human disease, but also think about advancing medicine and eventually improving healthcare. And in fact, so much of what these meetings have done is helped to define the, the two, the, the fourth and the fifth domain from a left to right progression on the far right to sort of bring heat, if you will, in other words, some of that red uh, area within these uh, density plots to aggressively try to move us more and more towards those areas to be able to realize improvements in medicine uh, using genomic and genomic information. So we like the strategic plan. In some ways, it's holding up quite well, um, and in many ways, almost everything we 
are doing in the, at the Institute and even the things we'll talk about here for the next day and a half very much are captured in the strategic plan. But I would just sort of point out that this plan was written in 2010. It came out of a lot of discussions in 2009 and 2010, obviously published in 2011, and yet we all know genomics is moving fast and furious. And so we simply came to the conclusion that it just was hard to claim or believe that a 2011 strategic plan written in 2010 represented a suitable blueprint for genomics as we entered the new decade. And so that's why we kicked off a new round of strategic planning, because we felt we really wanted something new and fresh to bring us into uh, 2020 and beyond. So in thinking about that, uh, we sort of have practical constraints how we're going to put together uh, a strategic plan, engage the community appropriately, and feel we could put a product out that will, will serve us well, as the previous plans have done. Uh, we planned a little bit about this in 2017 and then kicked it off, as I said, back in February. We know from experience this takes at least two years to do this well, and so we knew we were going to publish something in 2020, and that's what we wanted to do. We looked around 2020, and we felt if we waited until October, we could publish it at the 30th anniversary of the launch of the Human Genome Project. That just seemed like too good of an odometer moment to miss, so that's what we're going to do. Um, and then you just simply back things up. We'll submit a manuscript in July or so. We'll have a finale meeting of some sort in the spring. And then we just basically have all these various ways of engaging the community, collecting input and taking advantage of the expertise that we hope to get from lots of people to be able to put together a strategic vision as we've done in the past. What are those elements? Well, we'll just sort of use tools we've used before, and we'll add new ones along the way. Listed here are the kinds of things, everything from workshops to town halls to gatherings at existing meetings. That's what this is. Obviously, a lot of electronic presence. We'll use social media. Um, in ways we haven't, we didn't use before because it wasn't as much of a thing, and certainly we have a hashtag associated with this, with Genomics 2020. I don't really know what you do with the hashtag, but I know we needed one, so we got one. Um, we're obviously engaging advisory groups at all different levels, and then we, I'm certain, will have some sort of a finale meeting when we actually bring a draft. Um, and so where are, we? so we'll use all these things, and we're receptive to even other ideas along the way as well. We've had a number of gatherings and a number of town halls and a number of workshops and so forth already, um, but we're still pretty early. And in fact, just so you know uh, that, you know, we, where are we? Where we're about there. And so while we have some things in our rearview mirror, uh, we certainly have a, a long way to go, and, um, and we're excited about a number of things we already have on the calendar and things that we plan to add, and we're always receptive to other ideas of how to capture the kind of information that we want. One thing I thought it was worth uh, mentioning to, so that uh, you can appreciate how challenging this kind of a process is, um, and it also helps sort of define a little bit um, how we're going to sort of tackle this round of strategic planning compared to previous rounds, is to just sort of hit on uh, 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 an overarching, a very difficult issue that we always grapple with, and I think we are certainly going to grapple with this time. And that issue is, is you know, this strategic planning process about all of genomics as a field, or is it just going to be about what our institute is going to support? And, and th there is an important distinction, and we've done it different ways in previous rounds, um, but I think now is a little different, and so we are going to, we sort of have an idea of how we're trying to pursue this. Um, and let me just briefly explain it. I think it probably is not as hard to deal with with genomic medicine implementation, because I think almost all, almost all aspects of genomic medicine implementation are at the forefront of genomics. It's still quite early. It's still so much more to do. I'm sure we will play a major leadership role in implementing genomic medicine. But that's not true of all areas of genomics. And so this slide might be helpful in thinking about what we're trying to accomplish. I like to think about if we're at the forefront, it's sort of like we're a boat leading a fleet of other ships, uh, and that's what we've been doing for a long time. But our, the fleet is growing and growing, which is great because more and more people are doing genomics. Some of the things are within our wake, and some of the things are probably have moved outside our wake. And by that, I mean some things we will continue to try to lead, and some things we're just going to cede to others because that's appropriate and because others will do better with this than us. Some of these areas shown in red outside our wake are areas like cancer genomics, like microbial genomics and microbiome research. These are areas we had major footprints in less than 10 years ago, in fact, less than six and five years ago. But we think it's time probably to let others lead. It needs its own strategic planning. These are rich, incredibly important areas, and we sort of feel like these are probably out of scope for what NHGRI is going to be doing going forward. And there's probably other areas we will identify in a similar way that sort of are out of scope. When you get to what's in scope for us, there's sort of areas that we will do alone because no one else is yet there, and then the other areas will be sharing leadership and having major partnerships. 
I think about rare and common diseases. Clearly, we and many other institutes and other funders are working in that space. I think we want to strategically plan, but we will, rel we will certainly engage others and we'll partner with others in pursuing that research. Similarly, computational genomics, much bigger than us. Uh, we need to play a major role in it, but there will be others as well. I think they're sort of the mainstream areas where all eyes will be uh, on us for the most part to help lead in this, maybe not the exclusive funders, but they'll, we will be sort of, it'll be our mainstream areas. I list some prototype mainstream areas here, and there you will see genomic medicine implementation. Uh, and I think that's why I made my comment that I think this scope definition is probably not as critical for what we're going to be discussing over the next day and a half, because almost everything we're going to discuss is going to be a mainstream area for NHGRI, at least in terms of leadership. So that's sort of the way we're thinking about how to answer the question, what are we exactly going to be pursuing in this round of strategic planning? And the answer just is in another phraseology of the Genomics 2020 strategic planning will focus on the forefront of genomics as it pertains to human health and disease. And we hope that will help bound the discussion because we can't be strategic planning across all areas of genomics, but the important ones are the ones that we're going to focus on that we regard to be at the forefront. So, in summary, what we hope will come out of the strategic planning process will be uh, provide a driving force for much of genomics at NIH and around the world. We hope that coming out of this will be a clear, and yes, we are uh, being tongue-in-cheek, a 2020 vision for using genomics to advance human health. Obviously, as all previous strategic plans, this will guide the Institute's scientific priorities and shape our research portfolio. And, and, and importantly, it will foster partnerships with research, healthcare, education, policy, and various general public communities, I think in ways that simply wasn't the case in, in the previous strategic plans. Um, I think this, these sets of communities are growing and growing, making it very difficult, but also making our role in leadership increasingly important. And I think also that the strategic plan will really help us better shape and define our position at the forefront of genomics. So, as I said, it's very early in the process. We hope you will become engaged in this process in various ways. You will help us tomorrow at 1.30 when Anastasia Wise and Terry and I will sort of help uh, collect input from you, and, and, and Anastasia is going to nicely frame the kind of input that we want at that time. Um, but also, please follow our, along on the website. We're making everything we do very transparent and putting lots of things up on the website for people to look at. Obviously, you can email us anytime and you can follow us on social media with the hashtag indicated there. So that's what I wanted to tell you, and it looks like there's maybe even a couple minutes if people have any questions. So thanks for your attention. Thanks very much, Eric. Uh, questions for Eric? Comments? So one comment I might yep. make is that the, the meeting that, Air, uh, that Rex was referring to that we held in, uh, in Chicago was actually the direct outgrowth of our last strategic meeting, uh, strategic planning process when we, we sort of moved to the, the bedside to bench and, and uh, base pairs to bedside, I think is, was the, uh, the um, rubric. And, uh, and we would expect that our upcoming strategic planning process will also really help guide us in how we do implementation. So we're really hoping that at this meeting you'll keep in mind the fact that we're trying to plan our, our directions for the next five to ten years and, and where we go in genomic medicine implementation. I mean, do we just let it happen? It's probably going to happen, um, driven by, by other forces than us, or, or do we take a role in that and what role should it be? Uh, so, uh, I think that's a great point, Tara. I mean, I, mean I, I can't stress enough how you really can connect these dots between what is written in these strategic plans and then what, come, what happens. I mean, if you think back at the 2003 strategic plan, when we wrote that sentence where we talked about the $1,000 genome, you know, that came out, that we, the audacious claim to come up with a $1,000 genome, and out of that immediately came planning for a technology development program the Institute has implemented and has run ever since. Similarly, when the 2011 strategic plan came out, we had all this wonderful prose about implementing genomic medicine, and then we all looked at each other and said, well, how exactly are we going to do all of this? And coming out of that was a working group of council, and immediately the first of what is now 11 meetings, and you could point to many, if not all of those meetings, coming out things, either their funding announcements or new initiatives or other, other kinds of um, efforts, um, the, you really can connect the dots. So I can't stress enough that, at least in the case of NHGRI, our strategic plans really do provide a foundation from which things absolutely grow out directly from what is written. Robert? Robert. Eric, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, one of the fundamental questions Dr. Green, I'm, could yeah. you please push the button, please? Thank you. Test, I, test, yeah. I think he's good. 
w one of the fundamental questions that I'm hoping we confront in the next two days is when is there when is enough evidence enough to for implementation in any given specific or generalizable state? And I noticed your last slide there talk, had a bunch of partnerships, which I was <laughs> pleased to see. Uh, but I'm, it was up briefly, but I'm not sure I saw partnerships with regulatory agencies or with reimbursement, which may be very fundamental to that question of when is enough enough data. And I wondered if yeah. you might say more about that. So looking at that, I, I, I think I have the word healthcare communities, and so I think en encompassed within that. And remind me, I don't know if it's a Laura question or a Terry question, didn't one of the genomic medicine meetings early on deal with regulatory and we, we actually had two. So, yeah. so we had a, a sort of a um, stakeholders meeting. It was the third one um, that we held. A and then a, a, a fifth one had to do with federal partnerships. Um, both of those have, have yielded less than we would have hoped um, in terms of getting people to the table, but I think it's, it's improving. Uh, we do have several people around this table um, who are from uh, uh, communities outside of the, you know, the, the typical sort of academic research communities, and, and we very much value their input in terms of you know, how do we make this happen in a way that, that meets everybody's needs and doesn't break the bank in terms of, of American healthcare. And, and Robert, in, in the spirit of your question, no, we're not letting up on the accelerator of recognizing the importance of that part of this complicated ecosystem. Yeah, because I think if there was some way that NHGRI could help convene consensus on some sort of thresholds in that arena, uh, such that people would say, when we reach this point, we feel we have justified implementation, I, I think that could help a lot. That's a very tall order, though. Yeah. Mark? Yeah, I, I just wanted to... Um, riff on what uh, uh, Bob had, um, Robert had talked about. Um, first of all, I think the NHGRI has tried to serve the convening function. I think that the issue is, is that um, uh, for those of us that have lived the, uh, in particular the reimbursement uh, world for 20 years, uh, there is no such thing as consensus uh, in reimbursement. Each uh, of the payers is their own entity and um, uh, uh, without, um, you know, something that, that comes down uh, from the federal um, uh, system that says everybody will cover this, which seems highly unlikely uh, given the political environment. Uh, that's probably unrealistic, but that being said, trying to get input in terms of what type of evidence is uh, necessary is uh, a crucial role uh, of that convening function. The other thing that I wanted to mention that is more tangible um, it relates to another um, NHGRI funded project, which is ClinGen where the ClinGen process has actually been actively engaged with FDA, and the FDA is providing guidance in terms of how the ClinGen process could be used as part of the FDA's regulatory uh, process for uh, approval of genetic testing. And so I think that's a very tangible example of how the work that NHGRI um, is doing, starting this convening function, is actually resulting what, in what looks to be a, a, a policy a win, I think, for genomic medicine. I think we had one last question uh, or comment, Stephen. Thank you. Um, again, just riffing off Robert's really excellent question, uh, an implication of implementation science is a fairly radical basic um, change in sort of the, um, the party who uh, you are as an institute thinking of as your target audience, um, that hitherto the measure of success, you know, if you say we work essentially ultimately for taxpayers, the measure of success has been peer-reviewed publications, um, and NHGRI has clearly been incredibly successful in that regard. When it comes to implementation science and asking when is enough enough, uh, intrinsically there's a change in direction where it's no longer, uh, the, the ultimate product is no longer peer-reviewed publications. Instead, it is a focus back on uh, the taxpayer, but the taxpayer is going to measure success in terms of government agencies uh, within DHSS, such as um, CMS, uh, actually approving reimbursement uh, within the health service of the products that NHGRI is implementing. And, and that, to me, seems a very fundamental change in direction. Those of us who've been part of Insight have had our noses pushed against this for the last five years uh, and are very aware of it. And I, I, I just think that's such a deep uh, construct that it's something that really requires 
some careful thought about willingness to go that direction. Yeah, I mean, those are all great points. I completely agree. So I, I think we need to move on. Okay. I, I'll just, uh, to this last point, make a uh, note that one of the things that's, I think, a little different about this genomic medicine meeting is we've got pretty strong representation from some corporate entities that are working in this space as well. And so obviously this question of reimbursement is going to be very probably of interest to them as well. So I think that suggests that there's a strong evolution uh, to the point of how do we think about um, the final point of implementation science. I think this will be a theme that we should be talking about throughout the course of this meeting because it's a critical theme, it's a critical element of success for uh, genomic medicine implementation. So, uh, let, uh, oh, uh, Bruce, you came in a little late. You want to introduce yourself? <clears throat> you have to so press Bruce Corr from Dr. Yeah. Under it. I'm sorry. Yeah, Bruce Corr from the University of Alabama at Birmingham, uh, Chief Genomics Officer there. Sorry I was late. I, was, um, I had a board meeting of the ACMG Foundation. Anybody wants to donate, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so then, th thank you very much, Eric. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Jeff Ginsburg, who will moderate our first session.